Hello, and welcome everyone to the 5G Factor. I'm Ron Westfall, Research Director here at Future and Research. And today I'm joined by my distinguished colleague, Clint Wheelock, our Chief Research Officer. And naturally, we're very pleased to have him joining us today. And to recap, we are diving into our show called the 5G Factor, and it's all about the 5G ecosystem, as well as IoT, and basically all things that are related to the ecosystem that have caught our eye recently. So Clint, great to see you and welcome to your initial foray on the 5G factor. And how's it going? Tell us uh, a bit about yourself. Well, thanks a lot, Ron. It's really good to be here and uh, you know, always good to catch up on some of the latest developments in the wireless industry. Um, you know, it's funny, I've been involved in the mobile industry for about four out of the five Gs at this point. Uh, my, uh, you know, involvement in the industry began at a regional carrier. I was handling product management, product development more than 20 years ago when we were rolling out 2G PCS networks. So, so we've come a long way. Um, but I got to say, it's funny, you know, some of the killer, and I started off as a wireless industry analyst about 20 years ago as well. And it's funny how some of the killer apps we were talking about way back when for 3G are finally being realized with the rollout of 5G networks, you know, the, the low latency, the high bandwidth. I mean, that's a lot of it's the same story, but man, have the capabilities changed a lot. But uh, in any case, it's, it's been great to be able to keep a hand in the space over the years, you know, really working with some fantastic industry analyst teams. And so uh, this feels a lot like returning home, and it's great to be here on the 5G Factor today. Right on. Yeah, it's uh, like back to the future, you know, it's exactly. like for the 5G. So that's a great line. I might borrow it and, <laughs> and I, long live 5G itself. Uh, because I, 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 think you, I think you've been around, around for at least 4Gs yourself, if not all five. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And yes, I think we can kick off. And I think one thing that caught our eye is that Qualcomm uh, just shared its perspective on the state of the 5G uh, market in a recent blog. Mm -hmm. Specifically, uh, they're calling out for 5G to stand alone. And in other words, that's a high noon scenario for 5G. And that would uh, certainly be welcomed when it comes to 5G standalone implementations. And as a little background, um, to enable and energize the initial 5G standards uh, that started with 3GPP release 15, now that was implemented for 5G standalone starting in 2017. And as a result, across the mobile ecosystem, 5G non-standalone was implemented in the first wave of 5G deployments that we uh, witnessed. Now, the 5G NSA architecture, non-standalone, allows a, a new 5G radio access network uh, to augment existing 4G core and RAN capabilities. And uh, since NSA, or non-standalone, didn't require a 5G core network uh, to be deployed, mobile operators were able to accelerate uh, their uh, 5G timelines and bring, for example, 5G enhanced mobile broadband experiences to their customers sooner as a result. Today, 5G non-standalone is globally adopted and it's delivering enhanced smartphone experiences as we've seen. However, many of the key innovations in 5G require 5G standalone to literally be standing alone as the network architecture that is developed and designed to allow new differentiated services that could be more readily monetized for new revenue service as one example, but basically you know, for innovation across the board. And so Clint, from your perspective, how do you see 5G standalone making a difference in advancing the 5G market and moving you know, the 5G ecosystem forward and basically getting away from the hype, uh, the excess hype that we've witnessed over the last uh, few years with 5G standalone and getting us more uh, focused on real world practical applications and services. Uh, what's your view? Well, I mean, I, I thought the uh, I thought the Qualcomm news and the, the report, the key findings were, were spot on. And I mean, it really does seem like there are some key areas for 5G standalone can be a, a terrific uh, difference maker. Um, mainly those that focus around delivering low latency experiences. So 
few examples, um, scaling delay sensitive applications like extended reality, uh, including virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality and the like, and essentially the, the building blocks of the metaverse uh, that's right around the corner, um, which can expand some of the availability of cloud gaming and similar applications for consumers. And then on the enterprise and industrial side of things, so enterprise and industrial applications, um, things like digital twins, just to just to name a few things. And then, you know, also, you know, as I know you know, Ron, uh, there's a huge growth in independent private wireless networks that use network slicing, wireless Ethernet, programmability to meet some really demanding use cases. And these private networks are really picking up momentum and a lot of work and acceptance right now. Yeah, that's spot on, Clint. And I also see as another, I think, uh, prime example is wide area IoT uh, gaining ecosystem traction, particularly as uh, capabilities such as new radio light reduced capabilities uh, that enable device streamlining uh, for improved uh, cost efficiency. And that uh, is referred to in shorthand as REDCap. And so from my perspective, this can aid you know, the 5G private network adoption, as well as introduce new, new momentum for this adoption when REDCap becomes more readily available. And the good news here is that 3GPP release 17 basically uh, solidified that standard, that part of the standard, and it can start paving the way for standardized implementations across 5G networks towards the end of 2024. So definitely uh, REDCap capabilities will play a major role in making 5G standalone more successful and more commercially available. And as a additional background, specifically as of Q1 of this year, over 83% of all announced 5G devices supported 5G standalone. Yeah. However, but only 22% of the 524 operators out there that have already invested in 5G networks are also investing in 5G standalone. And as such, we're seeing the need for more operators to implement 5G standalone to further incentivize, for example, the developer community to prioritize 5G application development in areas such as a digital twin technologies and other areas that we already touched on, uh, for example, more advanced cloud uh, gaming capabilities and so forth. So this, is, I think, is a tremendous upside that we're really, we're only at the front end of the 5G journey as a result, even though we've already gone through this hype cycle that isn't unique to 5G. We've seen it with other technologies such as voice over IP and metaverse uh, that you touched on and many other technologies. but. What we're now getting is a level set, the ability to see that 5G is really just at the front end of the capabilities that it can deliver. And a lot of it's gonna depend on 5G standalone being implemented by more operators. And you know, for additional context, uh, when the operators saw that release 15 came out, that allowed you know, basically for the foundation of a 5G standalone architecture. That is uh, enabling 5G core capabilities to actually line up be aligned fully with 5G new radio capabilities and uh, overall RAN capabilities. And uh, so we're still seeing uh, the operators relying heavily on their previous implementation of LTE 4G core, but it's really with the 5G core implementations that we'll see, I think, many of these breakthroughs. And that, I think, started coming with a release 16, which basically addressed the needs of specific verticals, such as in the industrial, area as well as enterprises and uh, very exciting automotive use cases. But also what was important about release 16 is that it introduced precise positioning. And so this I think will be integral to how 5G use cases can really take off in, for example, the enterprise and industrial realms. But also uh, with now release 17 uh, becoming more uh, mature, again, those red cap capabilities are going to enable the uh, ecosystem out there to take advantage of those 5G IoT use cases that I think will uh, be difference makers in terms of, for example, the monetization mm -hmm. that we talked about, but also certainly those extended reality use cases that are all basically predicated on 5G standalone being implemented. And so I think on that note, we can wrap up the fact that, yeah, the 5G ma market really is uh, headed toward a lot more potential. 
And we didn't even touch on 5G advanced in <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> so yeah, and I have to say, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's fascinating to, to see, you know, what a long runway we have with the, you know, proliferation and growth of some of these key 5G applications. I mean, uh, you know, a lot for the operators left to enable, as, as you're mentioning. And then, you know, when we think about long tail applications, we typically think about, you know, kind of niche markets and things like that. But some of these are really substantial opportunities. So true. And I think that segues uh, very well into uh, a second topic that caught her eye, and that is Juniper just recently uh, unveiled its Juniper Beyond Labs initiative. And this is focused on shaping the future of network and IT industries with the goal of you know, pioneering a more research, driving more pathfinding projects, and yeah, basically just spurring more uh, experimental approaches toward how technology is a development. And you know, from your perspective, Clint, uh, what's your take on uh, Juniper uh, Beyond Labs initiative at this point? I, I was really encouraged by the uh, Beyond Labs initiative. I, I think for the Juniper customers and partners like Eurofiber and Intel, um, you know, along with you know, I have to say the broader academic community like Purdue University, uh, this Beyond Labs initiative should provide a great opportunity to influence research directions and pathfinding projects, um, and some of those contributions could spur some proof of concept demos, uh, the ability to provide feedback to shape the direction of that fundamental research as well. And, you know, it seems that uh, the participating members should have access to Jennifer Beyond Labs research and, uh, and innovation along the way. So I think it's, you know, I think it's a nice, uh, uh, initiative that, that really helps to expand the ecosystem and, and and really spur some some innovation along the lines of you know what we were just talking about with uh, you know the growth of new applications. Yeah, I agree fully, Clint, and I I uh, think it's also important to uh, understand that this is directly applicable to five G networking and the five G e ecosystem. Um, for example, we see Juniper extending its collaboration with Intel and working on the integration of the Intel FlexRAN reference architecture, as well as private 5G networks, Juniper RAN Intelligent Controller, and the Juniper Cloud a native router on uh, Intel Xeon processors as a part of this initiative. And all this is aimed at enabling new capabilities that can support 5G transformation. And as additional uh, context, the Intel FlexRAN is a reference architecture for virtualized radio access networks, or VRANs, as well as enabling and uh, advancing software-defined networking and network function virtualization across uh, 5G network fabrics. And I think this is uh, notable because Racket to Mobile, for example, announced that it is committed to continuing with Intel's FlexRAN architecture and chip technology for layer one processing in its next phase of implementing distributed units. And this is all important for, for example, open RAN innovation, but also you know, ensuring uh, that the ecosystem has the technology in place to enable the operators and you know, all the other partners and uh, naturally the end customers to be able to take full advantage of these 5G standalone capabilities that we've elaborated on. Yeah. And um, with that, uh, do you see anything else that uh, caught your eye out there, Clint? Well, I, as we were kind of looking through the stories and some of the key developments, one thing I thought was interesting that we were talking about is the um, Samsung and MediaTek announcement about completing their successful testing of 5G standalone uplink uh, for carrier aggregation. And I think that has uh, uh, C-band uplink MIMO to, uh, to achieve the top uplink speeds. And it seems that this is a pretty notable achievement um, in expanding and, and uh, you know, improving the, the, the mobile wireless capabilities. Um, and I'm you know, curious what your take is on that, Ron. Oh yeah, you bet. And yeah, this approach I see is using uh, what we can understand as three transmit antennas. So that in itself is a breakthrough yeah. because it's with these three transmit antennas that we can improve upload experiences. And I believe this is going to be integral to ushering in an era of enhanced connectivity for customers, including consumers and businesses worldwide. 
And as we've seen, the demands on uplink performance are increasing with the rise of applications such as live streaming, multiplayer gaming, and video conferences, and so forth. And now, uh, to be clear, upload speeds determine how fast your device can send data to gaming servers or transmit, for example, high resolution videos to the cloud. As, as we see more customers seek to document and share their experiences with the world in real time, these enhanced uplink experiences are going to be a difference maker when it comes to uh, not only improving the network performance we touched on, but also improving the overall experience for all the users out there. And so what we're seeing today is that smartphones and customer premise equipment can only support two transmit antennas. And as such, this industry first demo validates the enhanced mobile capabilities of three transmit antenna technology. And so this is exciting. This approach not only improves upload speeds, but also has added benefits such as enhancing spectrum and data transmission efficiency, as well as logically the overall performance of the network itself. And uh, notably, this test was conducted in Samsung's lab in uh, Suwon, Korea, mm -hmm. and they provided their own 5G network solutions, including the C-band massive MIMO radios, as well as the virtualized distributed unit, as well as the core for this testing. And so really, uh, this is a, a think an innovation we'll be keeping a cl close eye on. And on this uh, positive note, again, thank you very much, Clint, for joining our show today. I think people are delighted to hear your perspective and look forward to having you on additional 5G Factor shows as they arise. Well, thanks, Ron. I really appreciate it. Great opportunity, fun time, good discussion. And, uh, you know, we, we can't always talk about game changers, but I think we talked about a few key difference makers as, as we kept on uh, referring to them today. So that's, uh, you know, that's great, uh, you know, incremental progress within the industry and, and really kind of exciting to think about what's around the corner. But uh, thanks again so much for having me and looking forward to joining again sometime soon. Oh, you bet. And uh, yes, yeah, that, that's a typical July, you know, some difference <laughs> makers, but nothing quite, uh, you know, uh, ultra transformative, I guess, is one <laughs> that we hey, can throw out there. Difference makers, uh, we'll take them all day long. <laughs> Thumbs up. And to our viewing audience and listening audience, thanks again for spending time with us. And we look forward again to seeing you on our next 5G Factor webcast. Good day, all.